The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, Episode 88. Captain DeBridge, Spock here. Make so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. But today we're still talking about Picard and the latest episode called Absolute Candor. And joining me today on the panel is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And unfortunately, Father Corey could not be with us uh, today. He's under the weather and not feeling well. So in absolute candor, I have to say, I do miss you, Father Corey. Yeah. (laughs) Look forward to having you back. Yeah. Uh, If you uh, folks, if you're listening to this uh, as a file someone's given you or on our website, you know, you, you probably get a a better experience i'll just say right there if you subscribe using a uh, podcast app like apple podcasts or google play or stitcher tune in iheart radio or spotify uh, or another podcast app or if you uh, listen on youtube where you could hit the bell to get notifications of new episodes uh, just it makes it a lot easier to find those new episodes and to know when they're there when you're using a podcast app yeah. so let me but- recommend that But if someone's given you this file, that's totally fine (laughs) because these files are not copywritten in a way that prevents sharing. And so we want them to be shared. So thank your friend for sharing the file with you. And thank you, friend, for sharing it. (laughs) That is a good friend who shares the secrets of Star Trek with with others. Uh, So uh, let's talk about Absolute Candor, uh, directed by Jonathan Frakes, uh, 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 Ricard. Riker, sorry, John, uh, mm-hmm. uh, R- Riker from TNG. So a guy who knows Star Trek, knows Picard, um, and uh, really I think it shows in this episode. And it was also written by Michael Shabon, who's the showrunner for this uh, series uh, for of Star Trek. So uh, interesting to look at it from that perspective, knowing that they're behind this one. Uh, so we start with uh, Planet Vashti in the Beta Quadrant. Yeah. Total fake out. We thought we were going to free cloud and now we're going to Vashti. <laughs> That's right. Well, we start with, uh, again, another episode where we start with 14 years ago, a flashback mm-hmm. of that, that, you know, about the time where the Romulan relocation was going on and then the rogue synth attack on Mars. So Picard mm-hmm. lands at this settlement. It's a Romulan resettlement location. This is the way the Romulans being resettled from. Their and he's wearing planet. a Panama suit. Awesome. <laughs> it was a nice, a nice suit. Uh, he's treated as a hero. You know, people are excited to see him. And Oh, know. and we've got some really bad introductory dialogue because people run up to him and oh. we don't hear anything they say. Yes. But we do hear him like gesturing with his hands with the calm down signal. Yeah. And he's saying, I know you're all worried, but the Federation and Starfleet are here to help you settle. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, let's get some exposition across in the most wooden way possible. <laughs> I'm I'm here from the government, and I'm I'm here to help you. <laughs> so, also, before that, though, from orbit, we get to see the planetary defense system, yes. which is nice to see because these planets, at least if they're part of the Federation or being helped out, they're going to have planetary defense systems. And it's nice to see that. Yep. Um, also, we get to see a little boy dressed in black who steals a dragon fruit from a market. Yeah. And it's like, yes, that's not an alien fruit. I can buy that in the supermarket a block <laughs> away. That's clearly a dragon fruit. Those are all over California um, uh, supermarkets. And frankly, they're not worth stealing. They have almost no flavor. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> well, it, it, I have to say the the – the special effects for the planet Vashi, it's a, I like it. It's a fascinating looking, it's not just standard TNG painted matte backdrop. Like we're like we used to get. Um, it's a, it's a very interesting looking planet. And, uh, although yet another desert planet, I, you know, we, I'd like mm. some more variety if we can, but you know, California only offers way, so many different. 
<laughs> yeah. By the way, we should mention uh, the historical origin of the name Vashti because it may f- sound familiar to people. That's the queen of Persia in the book of Esther. Mm, so she's right. the wife of of uh, of of Esther's husband, the king. She's the one who's like gets all high and mighty and ends yep. up getting demoted as queen in Esther's favor. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's they don't come right out and say it. But the implication here is that this is not a, pl- a planet with of just Romulans, that there are other Federation species living on the same planet, that the Romulans are being yeah. settled on. I mean, they're, they're giant planets. I mean, there's plenty of room, right? Yeah, but we see they make a point of showing us humans. Yes. And and then later, when Picard comes back 14 years later, we see business establishments have signs like Romulans only, implying right. there are people there besides Romulans who are not welcome in these establishments. Right. So Picard goes to this uh, this residence, the the house of the Coat Malat, um, the, that is a, a an order of Romulan warrior nuns. Who, That's a thing. Yeah, well, there are warrior monks in Amer- in, in in Catholic uh, history, so they, why not warrior nuns, I guess? And they subscribe to something they call a, a philosophical uh, uh, ideology called the way of absolute candor, where they always tell the truth and they tell whatever it is they're thinking and feeling, which is supposed to be a, in, in contrast to the normal Romulan way of doing things, which is to lie at every Sup- opportunity. <laughs> well, to be super secretive, at least. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, the, this, these warrior nuns, the Coat Malat, they happen to be taking care of this boy. Their robes are gonna get in. They're gonna get in the way of action moves. Yes, uh, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna guess they must have like action robes versus uh, just everyday things. And uh, they 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 are taking care of this boy named Elnor, uh, who is separated from parents. As you might expect in these evacuations, you're going to have a lot of like kids and others who aren't with people. You know, something's happened. They're separated, and the understanding is these these nuns are ta- have taken him in to care for him until he can get a more permanent set situation as the right. settlement goes on. He, he's the one who stole the dragon fruit, right? Uh, and he has this connection to Picard, which is interesting uh, because uh, Picard has historically, and they, they bring it up, has not liked children. You know, he, he's kind of standoffish. He's not married, doesn't have kids of his own. And yet Elnor has this connection to him and Picard in back, which is very father-son-like. There's a relationship here between them, which is interesting. Kind of grandfather son like. <laughs> well, yeah, at that, that age it, it is. Uh, he brings the boy a a book. The boy asks, "Would you bring me?" As kids do, and so he brings mm-hmm. him a copy of the Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas, which is appropriate. I, I, I have to wonder if in the future, now maybe in a resettlement camp, the answer is this would still happen. But in the Star Trek universe, I have to wonder if kids would still ask, "What did you bring me?" <laughs> when you can just walk to a thing on the wall and say, "Computer, make this." Yeah. Or maybe it would be, you know, what did you bring me that you can't get from a replicator? That would yeah. be, yes. Um, also, also, I like in this episode, they bring back the Romulan greeting, Jolan True. Yes. From from Next Gen and the Romulan hand gesture, where when you're greeting someone, you put your hands together, palms together, and then you open them up like a book. Right. And we've seen that in Next Gen as well. And so they bring that in here as well, which is a nice touch. Yep. Yep. Um, and then uh, Picard, she, the, the, the woman, I, I don't remember her name off the top, that's all these names, uh, Zani, um, said, tells the boy, oh, you know, Picard doesn't like just this. Call her, just call her Mother Superior. Mother, exactly. Mother Superior says, uh, Picard doesn't like displays of emotion and is not fond of children, which he denies. And uh, and then he says, someday I may get used to the, the way of absolute candor. It would be disconcerting. I- yeah, but it's also clear that he really does like Elrond. Yeah, um, <laughs> and and they have a genuine bond, and he enjoys if we, he enjoys a fencing lesson, and with Elrond using uh, these bamboo sticks. Is that and, uh, are you being ironic or is that a, a Freudian no, slip? No, no. I mean, this is clearly Elrond. I mean, he lives <laughs> in this he lives in this uh, elven environment, yeah. you know, and he's clearly an elf with the pointy ears and the slender physique, and he's a very good warrior, and his name starts with E L. Followed by the letters R O N, only they're reversed in order. So yes. they 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 say it 
Elnor to try to pretend it's not Elrond, but it's really Elrond. That's very clear here. Yeah, I kept calling him Legolas uh, with dark hair. <laughs> There's very much a uh, uh, elven uh, vibe going on in this whole situation. I mean, it feels yeah. like Rivendell. I mean, it's it's it, got a little bit of that it, look. It is. It's not Vashti. It's Rivendell. <laughs> it really and, is. But it, it is really nice to see Picard having this loving, fun relationship with Elrond and with the nuns. He's genuinely yep. enjoying himself, talking to Mother Superior and all this stuff. Yeah, we get this montage of him, you know, reading the book to the boy, uh, teaching him how to fence, uh, you know, having a meal with them. And but it was it. We also then get interrupted where he's in the middle of uh, fencing with the boy and he gets a call from Rafi back on the ship. And this is where he learns that the synths have attacked Mars. So this is and then we have this break of this relationship with the boy, with this planet, because Picard never comes back. He goes back to Earth. He deals with Starfleet Command. He threatens them and resigns. And, and, he, and he's promising to come back. He thinks yes. he's only going to be gonna, gone for a short time, but then his life takes a different turn and he never comes back for 14 years. Right. And you can imagine how that will affect uh, Elrond. Uh, yeah. So now uh, back in the present day on the ship, we have Dr. Gerardi and Rios uh, on the bridge. And Gerardi goes on how bored she is. She's like, you know, hey, uh, I, I thought space travel would be exciting, but it, I've read everything I have to read. There's nothing that nothing else to do. And apparently in this version of Star Trek, as opposed to the the uh, the J.J. Uh, Abrams version, traveling through space takes time. Yeah. <laughs> We're back to the time like when DS9, when it took like days or weeks to get places. Uh, and I, I, I appreciate that. I, I like how... She does. She, I mean, her line when she comes up on the bridge to talk to Captain Rios is, so space turns out to be super boring. <laughs> and 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 that would be true. I mean, you might it's like when you're a kid and you think, oh, I'm going to get on a plane and I'm going to gonna go to this other place and it's going to be super cool. And then you get on a plane and it's like I have a 14 hour flight to get there <laughs> really with a five hour layover in the middle. Right, right. It's it is not the destination. It's not a, the journey. It is the destination that's thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> so and then uh, Rios talks to her. She goes uh, on about also, how also yeah. This is another subversion of like we had the previous episode where Picard is like, I never really got science fiction. Yeah. And so this is kind of another taking a taking a little bit of the air out of the gl let's glorify sci-fi bag. <laughs> that's true. That's true. She and then she kind of goes on a little bit. The babbles about uh whether it's space is really empty or full of things, and maybe we shouldn't call it space because that just implies it's nothing in it. And there's all kinds of things in space, like planets and galaxies. <laughs> she goes on. Maybe we should call it stuff. Yeah. I, I thought that was funny. She she did, though. Now, you, an obvious question is, why doesn't she do what everyone does when they're bored, is look at their phone. <laughs> right. You know? Now, she should have brought her phone with her, and she should have all of her her own favorite Inter entertainment and infotainment content on her phone. Yeah. But she apparently didn't. And, and so she looks in the ship's library, which is the second thing you should do. But for some reason, all Rios has is Klingon opera and, <laughs> right. and he says it's a long story. So that's a convenient way to explain why Agnes isn't entertaining herself with the ship's library that should have the complete works of everyone, every win in it. Yes. Uh, all she brought with her was two years of back issues of the journal of theoretical cybernetics uh, yeah. so that she, she's already gone through. So and probably then, on the phone. yeah, Rios apparently doesn't have uh, eBooks. He only likes paper books. Cause he talks to her about that book. We, we mentioned last time the, um, what was it? The tragic sense of life, and he he tells her that it's uh, it's about the existential pain of living with the consciousness of death and how it defines us as human beings, and and <laughs> Doctor Dreddy says, "Well, oh, that's a conversation killer." <laughs> so, yeah. that, that I ends. totally want to talk about the existential dread of living with the knowledge of death. <laughs> so uh, they are on their way to Vashti, and uh, it, it, uh, they they talk about like why they're not going to Free Cloud, where they think that. Uh, uh, Dr. Maddox is. And, and Rafi has a great line about this because she's <laughs> mad. She's just checked yeah. their something or other and found out they're not on their way to free cloud. And Rio says, we're going to Vashti. And 
Rafi is like, oh, come on, there, he wants to go there. And you, like a dutiful Starfleet officer, just accepted that instruction from him, to which right. Rios should have said, he's my client, he's paying for this. If he wants to go to Vashti, I'll take him to Vashti. I'll take him <laughs> anywhere he wants. This is about getting money. Yeah, if he wants to go to um, Disney World, we'll go to Disney World. <laughs> yeah. But um, I do like Rafi gets this great line that hints, uh, you know, based on what we've seen in, in the flashback to 14 years ago, she says that man can't even take a guilt trip without using a starship. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great line. Uh, so then we have uh, Picard, who's uh, not on the bridge. He's in uh, his study, but it turns out it's a holodeck version of his study, uh, which was created by the emergency hospitality hologram because Rios <laughs> has... <laughs> Hospitality emergencies. I love that. <laughs> uh, and apparently, if, according to the behind the scenes uh, Ready Room series on YouTube, uh, we're going to see uh, a number of more of these holograms that Rios has uh, in his ship. And it's interesting to see all of them. They're all slightly different personalities. Yeah, I, I think we may. There's another one in this episode. Yeah. I think we may have seen them all at this point, but there may be one or two more. Yeah. Um, that we don't see in this by this episode. Here's hoping anyway. <laughs> but the uh, the Mr. Hospitality is so again, it's the same actor who plays Captain Rios. All of the holograms on the ship have been skinned with his appearance. Yes. And they speak in different accents and we'll see later languages because one of them speaks Spanish. Um, this one had, I thought, an American accent. Yeah. Uh, so like the British, the medical hologram has a British accent. The navigation hologram has a, an Irish accent. This one has an American accent, if I recall correctly. And he knows how much uh, Rios does not like the holograms, at yeah. least ostensibly. I mean, yeah. presumably, and they talk about this in the ready room, presumably he, t he calls them up because he needs human connection. But then as soon as they start saying something he doesn't like, he gets rid of them. And he outwardly claims to not like them and only want them for emergencies. But Mr. Hospitality knows that. And being Mr. Uh, they, by the way, they call him Mr. Hospitality in the closed <laughs> captioning. Right. Uh, Mr. Hospitality, being a great host, knows when he's not wanted. And so as soon as Rios comes into the holodeck, he just like folds his hands together and vanishes. Doesn't have to be told to go away. I think it's a fascinating idea. Like this, this, this lone wolf character who it, at the same time kind of craves some sort of human contact and how these holograms that he has skinned with his own appearance. I mean, he has done this. Mm -hmm. They, they are some way, almost aspects of personality that he, that he mm -hmm. rejects. You know, that he he's can living in his own personal holographic gestalt. <laughs> yes, that's a great line. I might remember that for the uh, for, for, for advertising the episode. So uh, Rafi comes in and confronts Picard in this uh, version of his uh, hollow study, and she thinks he's mad to go to Vashti. And uh, Rios explains, you know, to Picard that the area is now a hotbed of criminals, warlords and the Romulan rebirth movement, which is interesting. Um and uh, Picard explains he's heading there to get a Romulan warrior nun, which uh, Dr. Rowdy thinks is a funny thing to, to, to imagine. I, I, I love when Agnes comes in, she just barges into the into the holodeck and says, is this a secret meeting or am I technically part of the crew now? <laughs> right. She's so she's so awkward. It's kind of funny. I, I like I like her, uh, her the manner here. And, and then she does get the awesome line, Romulan warrior nuns, that's a real thing? <laughs> exactly. Uh, and Dick Picard explains that they're, uh, they, you know, the, they're the way of to absolute candor, um, total communication of emotion without any filter between thought and word. I've known people like that. <laughs> and, uh, this... yeah, we call we call that Asperger syndrome. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so uh, Picard wants to go because he, he he kind of reveals to Rafi that he may never pass this way again. And he wants to reconnect with Elrond. Yeah, he doesn't say I want to reconnect with him, but that's clearly what he's thinking. And yeah. the I may never pass this way again is a great line. It's delivered movingly. Yeah. Um, also, we're told that the uh, the Koat Milat are the most feared enemies of the Tal Shiar. Mm. And so apparently they're able to protect themselves from the Tal Shiar. <laughs> that's how good they are. Right. And, and Picard says they're the best one-on-one -on -one fighters he's ever seen. Right. And and given Picard's 
age, you know, he's no longer the spry man that he once was. The he he needs a young man to be his warrior for him. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, to be his second in a duel. (laughs) Yeah, he's it's his interesting you know the acknowledgement of Picard's age and that he's Mm -hmm. you know unable to be the same guy that we remember. So uh, again, I like their embrace of this idea. Um, So then we're back on the cube where Soji is watching a recording of uh, Ramda, the Romulan historian, talking about um, something called Ganmadan. It's the day of annihilation when all life everywhere is destroyed, the apocalypse, uh, when the shackled demons break their chains and answer the call of the destroyer. And we remember that she used that she called Soji the destroyer. Mm-hmm. So yep. uh, that w- that would imply perhaps the demons breaking their shackles are Borg, say, maybe? or sense, or or, or, s- or other cybernetic life forms, possibly including the Borg. Right. That Soji is fated in this Romulan view to unleash. But this is apparently the thing, or part of the thing that is animating the whatever they're called, the Jat Vasht. Yep. Uh, the super secret, extra secret Romulan Tal Shiar that hates all sorts of synthetic life forms. They're concerned about a cybernetic apocalypse. Right, right. Uh, and so uh, they do something where they kind of superimpose like the so hologram. Re- really yeah. anti Skynet. Yeah, right, right. Or, or I was thinking of Ghostbusters with the the Destroyer of Worlds, where the you know the mm-hmm. the, the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man will show up. Choose the form of your destructor. <laughs> So uh, back to the La Serena, the Rios' ship, where um, uh, they, they reveal that in some exposition that Vashti used to be protected by something called the Fenris Rangers, which I'm kind of mm-hmm. curious. Fenris is a... Sounds, sounds fun. Yeah, Fenris is a term for uh, a, like a, a mythical wolf, if I yes. recall. Yes. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from, um, it's from Norse mythology. The Fenris wolf is a very powerful wolf who at Ragnarok, so this is the Viking apocalypse, Mm -hmm. kills Thor. Thor and Fenris Wolf kill each other. Okay, okay. Uh, So, um, but now they're apparently not protecting the planet, and Rafi says they don't have clearance to land. She tries to get a clearance to get through the shield, and when they... (laughs) This is so great. The card is like, Call central office and tell them it's me. And she's like, that's the first thing we did. And they're not giving us clearance. <laughs> so, so they have Take, to. Takes the wind out of his sails a little bit. Yeah, yeah. This is where we get the first hint that you won't get a, a hero's welcome again. Um, and so they have to, they have to, you can only beam through every so often. There's a very tricky arrangement. Yeah. They end up having to bribe them to, to let yes, them in. Yes, it's such a great line. They don't call it a bribe, though. Yeah. Picard is like, well, how can we move this along? And Rio says, a cash gift is always appropriate. <laughs> yes. It was like, and Picard looks so disheartened, like, oh, yeah. I'm used to being a Starfleet captain. I'm not used to bribing people. Right. This is not the Enterprise anymore. Uh, so Picard beams down and he, like I said, doesn't get that warm welcome. There are Romulan only signs everywhere, but he is, it is so sad. He's like walking around the public, same public square we saw earlier yeah. where everyone rushed up to him and he's like, hi, hi, hi. And no one is interacting with him at all. It's really pitiful. <laughs> yeah. Joel on true. And he gets these glares from everyone. Uh, and so he is welcomed by the sisters though, the, the, uh, the, the Kolat Mawula, uh, whatever it is. Uh, Kolat Milat. Yeah, Kolat Milat. I've got to remember that. The uh, the kayak sisters. I, I have it writ- written down so <laughs> I can look at it whenever I need. Very good. So the boy is now grown up into Legolas, and uh, he shows up, and he's angry at Picard because mm-hmm. Picard didn't come back. Uh, he has but, father, he has granddaddy issues. Yes, and Picard's surprised to see him. He thought that he would have been, you know, given up to, for adoption to somebody by this point, he didn't expect him to still be with the sisters all this time. Uh, so that's an interesting uh, development. And then uh, on the back on the cube, Soji and now Narak, the, the, her Romulan uh, boy toy, who is uh, really Jat Vash, they talk about Ramda, who is now in under sedation after her attempted suicide and freak out at, uh, uh, at, at Soji. And Soji challenges Narak. She says, I don't trust you. And so and then she directly asks him, are you tell she are? And instead of answering her, because, of course, he doesn't, he takes her sliding in a ventilation shaft. Uh, 
This like, is great. He sells it. This so this is like Derek's idea of a date, yeah. and and he says I'm going to show you a secret Borg ritual. And she's like, the Borg didn't have rituals. Oh, that's what everyone thinks. So let's go to this ventilation shaft, which is really slippery, slippery for some reasons because it's a ventilation return. Yeah, and he goes sliding down it, and I love this because I did this as a boy. I lived I lived on a dirt road out in the country, and in the winter, we'd get ice that would freeze over the rocks. I mm-hmm. think I've mentioned this before on the show, um, but it would fr- cause this layer of slippery ice over the rocks in the dirt road, and I'd go running and slide down, and I'd feel the the rocks under the ice rippling under the soles of my sneakers. And it's one of my favorite childhood memories. And <laughs> so I, I loved the, uh, the let's go sliding in the ventilation shaft, uh, Romulan date. We used to have our uh, backyard would, uh, would flood if there were, if we get rain in the winter and then freeze and it would be like a mm-hmm. nice skating rink. Yeah. Similar thing. Um, uh, but I, I like to imagine Borg drones uh, going sliding in this shaft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't quite fit for me. But uh, the, it's it's a bald faced act of manipulation, of course, to kind of yeah. throw her off. Um, but then he then he turns tables on her and confronts her with the information that she was n- never listed on the sh- the manifest of the ship that she says brought her to the cube. And and then what what about this knowledge you have of the Borg data files and so he kisses her and then kind of throws this in her face and she gets mad and, 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 and stomps off. And it's like, he needs like, Hey, you suspect me. I have trust issues with you. Now, of course he knows the truth, but he's trying to undermine he knows more her. about her than she does. Yes. And so he's, I think he's trying to like, he's, he's nagging her. They like actually, to use a modern term, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's this thing that these guys on the make do. It's, oh, it's really awful. Hmm. They'll, they, 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 like Meet- run down your date to hu- to kind of put them in their place or something and yeah. get them on your side? To approach a beautiful woman and tell her that she's not as good looking as she is in order to make her uh, insecure and thus want to convince you that she is. It's oh. really awful. It's, it's a terrible mm. manipulation and no yeah. one should ever do that. And, and it's kind of what he's doing to her here is he's undermining her to kind of make her want to get him to trust him. You know, to trust him more. Yeah, I got out of this scene. I mean, I didn't. I'm. I, I. I'm. Thank you for that insight because I did not understand what he was doing here. I mean, clearly yeah. they're both trying to manipulate each other, and he's especially trying to manipulate her, even yeah. though he really is falling in love with her because yeah. his his sister keeps telegraphing that he's going to turn one day. <laughs> um, his really creepy, over sexualized, mm. tense of incest sister. Yeah. Um. But uh, but I couldn't figure out what is he trying? How is this supposed to help him? Yeah, yeah. You know, because this seems like not the right time to bring this up. It's it's a tr- it's a very it's a clever way to to re- redirect her. She says, "I don't trust you," and so he sets her up to say, "Well, I don't trust you. You need to prove yourself to me." And that 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 she wants to build that wall. You know, the the bridge of trust with him. Again, and so that's it's an interesting tactic. Yeah, it's not how it's not how I would do it if I were Derek. I would I would let us have our nice ice skating date, <laughs> yeah. and then I would come to her later and say, you know, you mentioned you came on this ship. I I was recently um, asked to look up something about that ship by one of the people I work with, so I'm not taking the initiative here, right? And, and I saw your name wasn't on it. And right. I'm concerned. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah, but it's it this way is is even more sinister the way he the way he does it here. Yeah, that would seem, but that even then that wouldn't put her in a position of having to rebuild trust because he's not saying he distrusts her, and that's the tricky bit. Well, of it. but but I can depending on how the conversation goes, I could then insinuate I'm having I'm having doubts about right. you now based on this. Yeah, because no matter what, I mean, because she doesn't know that she wasn't on that ship, so she's going to say, "Well, I was on it. I remember being there." It's like, mm-hmm. I don't know if I can believe that. It does make you wonder if she wasn't on the ship. Like, at what point did she show up on the cube? Uh, in under what, you know, how was she inserted into this place in such a way that she fit in and that they accept her? If she didn't, mm-hmm. if like if Maddox didn't put her on a ship that. That he says he did. It's very interesting. I'm kind of curious how they're going to close that loop if they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so meanwhile, Rafi and Rios uh, back on the La Serena 
they they're following Vashti social media, uh, Vashti book, um, and they notice that social media is blowing up uh, with mentions of Picard being on the planet, and um, they it, and that people are mad because they're people are angry at Picard because he abandoned them from their point of view. He promised yeah. that he would save Rom more Romulans and that he would make sure that the people who are here are safe or and, and well off, and they are suffering. And and there is. I guess there's sort of two things to say about this. One is apparently Romulan social media is so hostile. There is a, there are threats emerging. <laughs> right. So it's like people are starting to get ready and show up and, you know, Columbine Picard or something. Yes. Um, and, and also even the co-op Milat point this out to Picard. He chose to save no one. So it's like they understand that the Federation pulled the rug out from him with this fleet. Yeah. But he just folded up and went to France. He right. didn't he could have saved additional people and didn't. And that's what they're really mad about. They're mad at him for the same exact reason Rafi is mad at him. And he hangs a lantern on it. He says, I let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because you could not save everyone, you chose to save no one. He 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 did the opposite of a Schindler. Schindler saved the ones he could in, you know, the, the Jews in World War II. Mm -hmm. And whereas Picard, you know, just, yeah, he just, yeah. I think he if emotionally. If I can't save everyone, I don't want to save anyone. Yeah, I think when he, when he, his bluff got called, I think he uh, uh, mentally and emotionally collapsed in on himself. And, yeah. And that, like, so, that, it's something I think that had been coming in Picard ever since the Locutus incident. I think that, that it's the culmination of all of those you know, hits all of those injuries to his to his mind. You know, we saw him in First Contact and in Nemesis, how he was still suffering from the effects of that and how and perhaps when Data died saving him, that was the final blow that weakened the structure. And it was just well, not the final blow, but the well, penultimate blow. Yeah, it was certainly a blow. Yeah. Uh, so. uh Picard is but, also but also yeah. notice he's used to functioning with Starfleet doing stuff for him. Right. He's, he's suddenly a fish out of water. He's never had to do what Rafi has done, which is operate without the big Starfleet machine behind you. So he might have right. a greater inclination to just give up since he's never had to you know, do anything big without Starfleet backing him up and providing him the resources to do it. That's true. Uh, so we also find out that there's a, uh, a this warlord who, uh, you know, in this sector who has an old Romulan bird of prey that Great is... Great to now, see that. Oh, so much fun to see that. Because we just... Uh, in fact, I think it's an episode that's coming up after this season of uh, Picard. We'll be talking about that first season episode of the original series, Balance, Balance of Terror. Of terror. Uh, so it, it's it's fun to see the the old Romulan bird of prey on screen, and uh, so that's coming. So that's a we have a clock ticking, and then Picard back on the planet is upset because things didn't turn out like he wanted for Elnor and for the refugees. And this is where Mother Superior tells him, you know, you you allowed the perfect to become the enemy of the good. And so Picard says, I'm going to appeal to Elnor to bind himself to my cause. And this is what Picard's there for. The Coamalot are the great warriors. And they have this tradition of someone will come to them with appeal, and if they like the appeal, they will bind themselves to the cause, t you know, to the death, like yeah. completely. But but there's a condition that has to be met for this, which right. they don't tell us at first. They keep hinting about it. Yes. Um, and they have this. So it's another reason this guy is clearly Elrond is they talk like this because it's, will you bind your sword to my cause? <laughs> I mean, how Middle Earth is that? <laughs> Well, one does not simply walk into a board cube, <laughs> to yeah. quote yeah. <laughs> Sean. I'm waiting for Sean Bean to show up. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Elnor asks, why do you want me specifically? And Picard talks about, oh, I'm old and you're young. But what well, Elnor Picard wants us from... is so clueless in this scene. <laughs> yes. He and wants, like, yeah. dude, just say, I want you because I want to be with you. Right. And I I didn't have that chance before and I want it now. I want you because you're you. The simple expression of human affection and closeness of being a grandfather figure to him 
a mentor of whatever, but expressing that emotion, which Picard has, has trouble doing throughout. Um, so Elnor rejects him and Picard leaves and he, he goes back to the, to the, uh, the square where he picks a fight in the bar. He decides to Rosa Parks this situation. <laughs> yes. I like, mean, it says Romulans only. He goes in, he sits down, well, he, he tries he to... takes the sign down and yes, stomps on it. Steps on it, yeah. <laughs> so, and, yeah, provocative. And, and he goes in, he sits down, he demands service, service is not forthcoming, and then he starts to attract exactly, it's like, dude, you've just been told Romulan social media is blowing up and there are threats against you. Yeah. This is dumb. Now, is Why he, are you doing this? Is he doing this on purpose to, to have the result he ultimately gets? Is it he doesn't seem so. He yeah. doesn't lost sight of Elrond. He doesn't know where he is. He just decides to go defiantly do this. Right. Even though he knows he's in it's like your mission to save Soji and and all that implies for the future of synthetic life, you're putting that all on the line here for what? not good reasons. Right. What is what does he this hope is, to accomplish? This is suicidal virtue signaling on your part. <laughs> right, right. So this this ex Romulan senator named Tengim Adrev uh, approaches him, who now just looks like a, a gang boss of some sort. Um, lectures Picard, recalls the promises that we made in the evacuation aboard Wallenberg class transports, which is an interesting name. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg again famously saved many Jews uh, during World mm-hmm. War II. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So I, I I I like that reference the, there. It, it was called the Nightingale. Uh, uh, the the one particular ship, and he accuses Picard of taking advantage of Romulans in their moment of doubt. That Romulans, if if you hadn't made us doubt, we probably could have found a solution to our problem. Uh, you know that that, and we wouldn't have needed you, and you, but you did this to us, and so he's force forces yeah. Picard to engage in a duel. So so the basic idea he's selling, if I understand correctly, is we would have been able to take care of ourselves, but you came waltzing in with this magical offer of a rescue fleet, so we wouldn't have to do the hard stuff ourselves. Right. And then after we'd committed to letting us ourselves be rescued by you, you yanked the fleet out from under us, and we didn't have time to find a solution at that point. So it's all on you right. that so many people died. Right. And you can understand how people they want someone to blame and they they need a face to blame and they blame the one who promised to save them and didn't. Uh, So Mm -hmm. I get that. Um, So we have this. He throws a sword at Picard and wants him to sword fight him, which, again, elderly Picard is this is this would be a slaughter. Um, And so Picard throws the sword away. But Elnor steps in. And yeah. he, he takes just, just everybody like out. like at Tanagra. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. No, I'm not going to fight you. Yes. The, so uh, Picard and Elnor at Vashti <laughs> <laughs> when the walls fell. And uh, so, yeah, Elnor steps Behead in. Head fell. <laughs> That's right. Beheads the uh, the ex-senator and saves Picard. Uh, and and it's, it's he the way he sets it up is it's like, Picard is under my protection. If you choose to fight him, you choose to die. Please do not make that choice. Yes. And and he uh, he he goes. Uh, the senator goes to fight Picard anyway. And at this point, Elrond does this amazing elfin leap and flip and <laughs> slice with the sword, and his head slides off his neck. Yes. And we see all the green blood and stuff as it does so. Yes, this is a very gory Star Trek here. Uh, so we're we're yeah, we're we've in never Star seen Trek. this kind of decapitation before on Star Trek. No. So before they leave, Picard takes the moment to apologize to everyone around him for his and the Federation's failure to live up to their promises and for breaking faith with them. So, like, he's not going to leave on the, you know, killing this guy and, and leaving. He Like, no, like, I didn't want this, and I am mm-hmm. I am, I am sorry. Uh, and then when they, they beam back up, he rips El, Elrond over the killing the Romulan and makes him swear only to fight when I specifically tell you to. Like, Yeah, he says that, that man did not need to die. Right. You know, El, yeah, Elrond says, well, no, I, I gave him a choice and he that's what he chose. And knowing who Elrond, presumably knowing who he was and what kind of fighter he was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they all knew he's the he's the the co-op Malat boy. Yes. The 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 one who's not a girl, but who is the Kalankai, I think he calls himself. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so they know what that role is and they know he's if he's been trained by them, he's really he's really bad. Yes. So back on the cube, uh, creepy Narissa shows up in her brother Derek's quarters and while he's sleeping and they go back and forth over Narek's loyalties. It's not a whole lot to, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, it's a back and forth. It's an interesting, you know, exchange, but there's not a whole lot to say about it. Really. She it's makes him new. say what Soji is. Right. And he, he says she's the, I know this, I want it, that she's the Hebsed festival. Um, <laughs> Seb Shineb. Yeah. Seb Shineb, there yeah. we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, Heb said was a festival pharaohs had after their 30th year anniversary to rejuvenate them by wrestling younger men. It is vaguely Egyptian, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, so she's she's this thing, which is the destroyer. So right. um, sister makes her brother acknowledge that he's working with this destroyer. So like really, really, really totes don't get the feels for her and betray us, okay? Right, and I'm going to pretend that I'm about to kiss you and then choke you, and yeah, you know, creepy ugh. in both cir- circumstances. I, I, I'm not a fan of this whole weird vibe that they're putting between them like that. It's it's, it's uh, a little Caligula and Agrippina the Younger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so m- meanwhile, back in the orbit of Vashti, Kar Kantar, that's the the guy with the bird of prey. They show up and they start shooting at uh, the, the the La Serena, and uh, he activates the emergency tactical hologram, who speaks only Spanish and looks hungover, which I think is and, and has like a different hairstyle. He's got this kind of I don't know biker drug lord member <laughs> hairstyle, gang member hairstyle, this unruly mane of hair, <laughs> and he's kind of slouched over the console, uh, and again speaks only Spanish. It's kind of it's a fun thing that they're doing with this. I I, I think mm-hmm. it's uh, enjoying it. And they they get into some deep trouble until another ship shows up to help them defeat the bird of prey. But that ship gets mortally wounded as it takes out the bird of prey. I, I think they could have done a little more with the exposition in this scene. But what I got from it is the bird of prey is like forcing them towards the planetary defense system. Right. And the, then using the defense system to injure the La Serena. And then this other mystery ship shows up and starts helping him out and slices off <laughs> one of the warp nacelles of the, uh, the bird of prey. The old bird of prey. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's uh, that'll end the things quickly. And, uh, the, the, the other ship is wounded. Um, and they says that we're being hailed or Rafi says we're being hailed and Picard <laughs> the old habits says open hailing frequencies. And then he's like, oops, uh, uh, you, you, Captain, you you can order that, and he says yes. Open the hailing frequencies, and mm-hmm. uh, the pilots wanting to be beamed aboard. Uh, they beam the pilot just in time, and it's seven of nine. But we Yay. knew she was. We knew she was coming, and here she is. Um, Picard, you owe me a new ship, and then she collapses. Yeah. And, so the, apparently they know each other because when as soon as he sees her, Picard says seven of nine. And he could have, you know, read or I guess they I mean, hypothetically, they could have read about each other in reports, but it seems like they know each other. Yeah. And Seven of Nine says, Picard, you owe me a ship and then comically faints end of episode. Right, right. Fade, fade to black, <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> and uh, so uh, and that's that's where we end this week. Uh, presumably next time we're going to get uh, more of. In fact, in the the. Previews. previews we see we really the, do get to free cloud we get to free cloud uh pop-ups are totally a thing in the future pop-up ads are totally mm-hmm. a thing in the future and uh and there's going to be a lot of shooting there's going to be a lot of action in the next episode so uh we can mm-hmm. be prepared for that uh so um jimmy your your thoughts about this episode in general or anything I, else i enjoyed the episode um i i one thing i didn't mention i like that they had bugs in the CGI. And by that, I don't mean mistakes in the CGI. Yeah. I mean, insects. on this planet, <laughs> we see CGI insects flying around and that and close-ups of them. And that's yep. nice. Yeah, nice attention to detail. They didn't have to throw that in, right. but it adds verisimilitude. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of, gra- we don't mention it very, very often, but there's a lot of great CGI in both this and in Discovery uh, that, that goes into for a TV show. Like it's cinematic quality. It's really movie mm-hmm. quality uh, that they're putting into these. And, and I really do appreciate it. And it does, but yet it feels still feels like Star Trek and that's, that's good. Uh, but I, I really enjoy this too. I think uh, I, I'm really enjoying Rios. He's a really interesting character. Um, I still get the creeps from Dr. Gerardi. Um, 
I'm curious to see where things are going, and I'm really excited to see how. I like so- Dr. Girardi. I, I, yeah. As soon as she gets out from under this mind meld she's being influenced by, she's going to be a really great character. <laughs> yeah, that'll be interesting to see where this the, this Manchurian Doctor candidate thing is going to go. Um, mm-hmm. That I'm I'm really interested in seeing how Seven of Nine has changed over the past couple decades, you know, or so that that she's yeah. been since she was on Voyager. I mean, she's she seems a lot and more she, at ease. Yeah, she's clearly loosened up, even from just the one line she has in this episode. The old Seven of Nine would not have said that. Right, right, exactly. Or wouldn't have said it that way. It would be like, Picard, you owe me a ship. <laughs> right, she would be much more stiff and formal. Uh, so very good. And so the next episode is called uh, St- uh, Star Cloud, uh, Stardust City Rag. Uh, so that's coming up. So uh, I think that'll do it for this time. Um, yeah. I, I do want to take a moment to uh, thank our patrons who made it possible for us to create secrets of Star Trek, including David P., Christian D., Donald A., Father Burke, and Daniel E. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give. Make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. I, I do want to don't want to forget, actually, we did get some feedback on this episode, and I really wanted to, to bring it up um, from last time. We talked uh, uh, episode 87. The end is the beginning. We got an email from Gregory Kinstetter. And if that name sounds familiar to you as a listener to SQPN uh, shows, he is the brother of Father Andrew Kinstetter, the host of Secrets of Star Wars. Right. And he uh, so Gregory says, I wanted to say I really enjoy your podcasts. Uh, my brother, Father Andrew, turned me on to you guys. And I've listened through all of Discovery and I love your episodes regarding D- DS9 because I personally think DS9 is the deepest and most underrated Star Trek show. I, I'm in agreement with you. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't? Uh, I mean, all the smart people do. Exactly. Um, he says, I, I, uh, I wanted to give you guys two thoughts I have so far regarding Star Trek Picard. I'm loving the, loving the series so far. I love how it is much more dr- drama and action filled. It just feels more like Star Trek. One, with the realization of the Jat Vash within the Tal Shiar and their deep loathing of synthetic life, do you think that maybe the Jat Vash orchestrated the Shinzon coup in Star Trek Nemesis to lure the Enterprise to Romulus to ultimately destroy the one synthetic life form known to be in operation at the time? Commander Data? It's an interesting hypothesis. I'd have to go back and rewatch Nemesis to see if there's points that could be understood as evidence in favor of that. Mm-hmm. It certainly would be a dramatic revelation late in the Picard series for Picard right. to realize the reason my friend died is because he was lured into this situation by the synth killing Jad Vash. That would be an interesting development. And could yeah. be a very strong motivator for Picard, even more than what he had so far. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and yeah. then, and I don't it, know if they'll do it, but that would be a great character moment. And mm. I, if I were writing and someone suggested me to that, it's like, oh, that's definitely going in. We created this clone of you in order to manipulate you into this. Well, they could have said, I mean, the clone was created years ago. Oh, that's right. You know, maybe maybe before Data even existed. But that's true. Um, let's use this clone to get him over here. Yeah, yeah. Where, so we can deal with this guy. Interesting. But you, ha- I'd have to rewatch it and see. I mean, there's always, it's sci-fi, so there's always a way they could do it. But they need to provide some explanation for exactly how they manipulated Data into dying. Right. Using in, in what's otherwise a chaotic situation. They need to say somehow they were pulling strings to engineer that scene where Data self-sacrifices. Right. And then uh, his second point, uh, I suspect that this current mission with the current crew on the La Serena will fall at some point and or fail at some point. And Picard has to go back to Earth to seek the loyalty and advice of a former number one, William Riker and his wife, Troy. I just want to see what your thoughts are regarding these these theories. So. I I don't know that that means that him going to Riker means that he has to go back to Earth to see him, uh, to to kind of get a new crew. My mm-hmm. guess is something comes up where Riker has or or Troy have information that he needs. Um, yeah, I don't know that they're back on Earth. Yeah, uh, that too. In, in, and I think it depends on what you mean by this mission with the La Serena is going to fail. I think they're definitely going to encounter plot obstacles. So I think based on 
things I've seen and deduced, I think they're going to go to free cloud and they're not going to be able to get Maddox for some reason. And there will be some kind of plot complication that keeps them from getting to him quickly. And, and so if you want to call that a failure, you could. Um, but I think they, the Motley crew that they've assembled is going to be with us through the rest of the season mm -hmm. and even into future seasons. Yes. I, I agree. I think, I think what, well, yeah, like we said, like you said, Riker is not necessarily on earth. The, 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 the Rikers uh, maybe have settled on another planet. Um, or the Troys. Who, I mean, it, given her mom, they could be very assertive about that kind of thing. <laughs> this is true. It's uh, William Troy. <laughs> so they're uh, they're now living, or they're or they're hyphenated. Who knows? They're they're wherever they are. I think they have information that Picard realizes th that they have and that he'll need from them. I think that's probably what's m most likely. Uh, so thank I guess, you. I guess yeah. uh, Deanna has has uh, inherited the holy chalice of of Reeks at this point, <laughs> probably, which is just uh, like a cracked pot or something. They told us. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be awesome if Luxana shows up unexpectedly? <laughs> well, but Major Barrett would have to appear via CGI. Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I mean, sadly, not quite there yet. Yeah. yeah. Sadly, she's passed out. But if they if they could introduce. The topic of Luxana in there and that he would have to then explain to Rafi and the others. That would be fun. I'd like to see that mm -hmm. uncomfortable Picard again. So uh, th thank you, Greg, for that uh, for that email. And then uh, we also got another email from Lila Phillips who writes, I, I enjoyed the podcast. Love the Picard show. Just thought I'd pass along the Romulan couple, the uh, Jabin and um, the, the couple in the vineyard are married and on the run. They're in hiding on Earth. That's why they couldn't really go with Picard. It's explained in the three issue comic series, which he highly recommends. Mm -hmm. We actually, we, yeah, we, I, I sent an email back. Yeah. We did actually know that, uh, Lila, but thank you. We, we actually have a, um, a, a special episode of Secrets of Star Trek that we did for our patrons that will eventually release to the whole audience. But we did it as a thank you to the patrons where we discussed the, the three episode countdown uh, comic series. So uh, I, I think yeah. our confusion was not so much like that, that, that they're on the run, but that they they had to stay behind to yeah. take care of the vineyard. Yeah, in my view, I, I mean, I know they're in hiding on Earth, staying away from other Tal Shiar, but now their location has been burned. Yeah. The Tal Shiar know they're there and have already tried one assassination attempt. In fact, they shot first, and the only reason that um, Zay, uh, Jaban didn't die is he ducked providentially. <laughs> right. So if they, and and then they were just told Oh, and Picard, you got to get out of there because there's more on the way. Well, if they're more on the way, it's not yeah. safe for them to stay there either. Right, right, and it's yeah. Apparently, the the the, the Jadvas are operating with impunity on Earth, and so this, this it's not a safe haven for them there. Uh, yeah. So, all right. So, thank you both for the that feedback. We really do appreciate it. And we love to get feedback from folks. And if you have some feedback you want to share, you can do so by going to the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our facebook page facebook.com slash starquest media or you can send an email to trek at sqpn.com and we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the next episode stardust city rag until then jimmy aiken thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of star trek Thank you so much, Dom. Live long and prosper. And Jolan True, which I have just decided functions like Aloha, so you can use it for both hellos and goodbyes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, it's a good explanation, as any. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, Picard can't even take a guilt trip without using a starship. <laughs>